So what we're going to do is, we're talking about the thoracic spine, like I mentioned, we're going to be reviewing the anatomy. And then, did you start the camera? So we're going to review the anatomy, the bones, ligaments, neural muscles. Uh, then we'll talk about different conditions and injuries. And then we'll do the exam techniques. There's not a whole lot of exam te special tests and things for the thoracic spine. So what we can do is we can review the uh, cervical test as well, and thoracic outward. All right, so here's your typical thoracic vertebra. And what's different about the spinous process on these? Because it slopes down. So in the upper thoracic, the upper thoracic, they're going to be closer to the way the cervicals are, so, so they're not going to taper down as much. You get into the middle thoracics, that's where you have the peak, the most amount of the downward shifting. The spinous process will be at the level of two transverse processes below. And then as you start getting into the lower thoracic, then they start transitioning more towards lumbar. So then they're going to be, they're not going to taper down as much. So they start out like this, they gradually point farther down, and then they start changing back to more straight back. And the primary motion in the thoracic spine is going to be flexion extension. And when we talk about the facets in the thoracic spine, I mean, that's one of the main differences that we'll talk about as we go through the different parts, the cervical spine, thoracic, and lumbar, is that the position of the facets. Because the disc surfaces are always in the transverse plane. The facets are what's going to control how the different movements occur in the, in the different parts of the spine. So you can see in the thoracic spine, the superior articular processes faces primarily posterior, but also superior at about a 60 degree angle. Okay. And then it does kind of slope, have a little bit of an outward angle like this. So again, you're going to have a combination motion of lateral flexion and rotation. Okay. Primary motion is going to be flexion extension, and when you flex forward, the facets are going to open up. When you extend backwards, the facets are going to compress. But the fact that it's anchored to all the ribs is what controls the fact that there's not a whole lot of range of motion in the thoracic spine. Okay, so again, like I said, the thoracic the SPs uh, extend downward. In the middle of the thoracic spine, it's going to be about two levels down. In the upper and lower, it's going to be about maybe one level down. And then also on each of the thoracic vertebrae, there's other articulations because you have the rib coming in. Right? So the rib articulates with the transverse process, one rib per one transverse process. But as it comes in, it's going to articulate with two different vertebrae. Okay? So they're, they're called demi-facets. Where on, on each of these vertebrae here, there's an articular surface here, and then there's also one on the upper part of the vertebral body. So one rib's going to come in like this, and it's going to articulate with part of the upper part of one vertebra, and then the lower part of the vertebrae above. So as each rib head comes in, it articulates with two different vertebrae. You understand? So that's going to be, you know, here's one demi facet, here's another one. And so then the joint between the transverse process and the ribs is going to be called the costa transverse joint going to be here. All right. And then what would you call it where it articulates between the rib and the vertebra? If the other one's costo transverse, then it's going to be costo what? Costo vertebra. Okay. Then we talk about the rib cage. So we have the sternum on the front here, which you have the, the manubrium, which is the top part here, the body, and then the xiphoid process. 
And now the ribs are divided into three different categories. What constitutes a true rib is these ribs here where it's a bone that, trans that transitions into cartilage and goes right into the sternum. So the true ribs go have a direct one-to-one -one connection between the, the rib and the sternum. And the false ribs, is starting here, this rib, this cartilage of this rib ties into the cartilage of the one below. So it doesn't have its own direct connection, it just sort of piggybacks onto these other ribs here. So that's going to be 8, 9, 10, these three here. And then the last two here are floating ribs where they don't have any cartilage on the tips. And then again, if you use the concept of the vertebral motor unit, you have the anterior portion, which consists of what? If we divide it right here. So what's this here? Vertebral body. Then what's what covers the front? Anterior ligament. Anterior longitudinal ligament. And then the counterpart of that on the back side would be what? Posterior longitudinal. So that's anterior motor unit. Then. Coming back, you have the pedicle, the lamina, spinous process, basically the vertebral arch. So everything that covers the vertebral bump behind here. And so the articulations in the anterior motor unit is basically the disc space. You have the end plate of one vertebra, the end plate of the other, and then the disc in between. In the posterior motor unit, you have two sets of facet joints. And then those costal vertebral and costal transverse, those aren't really part of the vertebral motor unit, but they are parts of the joints of the spine where you have, and then this shows where I was talking about here where you have a demi facet, where this rib articulates with a transverse process, but then when it comes into the spine, it's part of this rib is articulating with that vertebral body and then the one below. And then on the front here, we have what's called costochondral. Costa meaning rib, chondro meaning cartilage. So you have an actual synovial joint here. Right? And when we talk about traumatic injuries, you can have a separation right there. What happens is the rib, the junction between the rib nerves separates. And then you have Sternocostal. And then even though this is, should be really chondrosternal, sometimes you either call chondrosternal or costosternal, where the rib articulates with the sternum. And then there's all the different thoracic musculature. I'm just going to go through these really quick because they're not necessarily going to clinically mention each individual one. Basically, these are all either extensor muscles, or when you get into the deeper muscles, they're going to be rotators, the deep muscles of the rectus spinae. Multifidus, semispinous thoracis, finalis thoracis. And then you have the intercostal muscles. Basically, the external intercostal muscles run like this. Say the external costals run this way, it's like if you're putting your hands in your pockets. So they run from the in, posterior inferiorly on this rib, and they run in an anterior to inferior direction. So they're going a little bit more anterior, and they're going from the back part of the upper rib anteriorly like this, just like you're putting your hands in your pockets. External costals, and then the internal costals run the other way. And then you have the serratus muscles, rhomboids, trapezius. The rhomboids and the trapezius, then you're talking about muscles that, that affect the, the scapula. And we'll talk more about those when we talk about shoulder 